working on recruitment without the core elements of what you need to do to retain diverse talent is a fool's errand, in my opinion. You're just creating an 18-month revolving door. That's Julie Kaufman, Bain's Chief Diversity Officer and head of our global diversity, equity, and inclusion practice. And she has a cautionary tale for firms that are aggressively on the hunt for diverse talent. You might work really hard, put it all out there on your search firms to find you diverse talent, but if when they join, they don't feel strong senses of belonging, support, and trust, they will exit that organization in the next 18 months. Today on the show, I'll ask Julie Kaufman about Bain & Company, its own DEI journey, and what it really takes to pave a more equitable path for your diverse talent. I'm Hugh MacArthur, head of Bain's global private equity practice, and this is Dry Powder. When we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, that can mean a lot of different things. And where I wanted to start with you is Bain's own journey, particularly since you had a leadership role in developing some of these programs, just to kind of walk me a little bit through some of the early efforts to diversify the team at Bain. And what was it like setting up these programs? What do you think worked really well in helping to build a leadership team that, that even our clients have noticed? The beginning is hard. We had to do two or three things to sort of really galvanize efforts here. Number one, we had to have a case for change. We had to demonstrate that, A, we were leaving talent behind, that we really needed to grow. But as importantly, if not more, that our clients were demanding this of us, that actually showing up without enough diversity in our leadership teams is going to start to cost us business. And as our own partners would come back with stories of either proposals that didn't go so well because of a lack of perhaps diversity on the team, or on the flip side, great successes where the diverse team came up with innovations that maybe wouldn't have been thought of without a whole bunch of different people of different backgrounds. But then more than that, we had to also really work the kind of line leadership and use all of our change management disciplines, if you will, to sort of talk about what are the metrics, how are we going to measure progress, what are the interventions we think might work, and then how do we make sure using sentiment analysis, like looking at our NPS, if you will, of the different populations, but also looking at our representation data by office, by practice, in order to make sure that we could understand where do we have success that we can double down on and replicate, and then igniting enthusiasm by demonstrating ways that we could change the outcomes. What initially drew you to the question of thinking through DEI for Bain & Company? Yeah, you know, I joined Bain in the late 80s, and there were already what I'll call communities that supported folks of different backgrounds. So we had a Women at Bain group, and I didn't give it much more of a thought than as a way to make friends more easily, but not really an important part of my professional career until the point I probably got to manager and starting to recognize that there were fewer women at some of the clients I was serving, but also internally, and that we didn't have as many women on the leadership team as we had in my start class out of college. And then it wasn't until probably in the mid-2000s where we started to actually really note that at the partner level, we were really hitting a bit of a wall and we were looking much more male at the partner level than anywhere else in the firm. And that was hurting us a bit in recruiting, we felt, and also in client service. And I was privileged to be asked to lead a group of partners in thinking through why was that and then how can we put a plan together? You know, after 30 years at the firm, my memory is not as good as yours, but I do remember that when I joined Bain, we looked a lot like what business schools looked like at the time. And business school classes, certainly where I went to business school, were largely white males. In 1990, we reflected the sources of talent, if you will, that we brought into the firm. Uh, But one interesting thing that I observed over time is that business schools have evolved to where they're much more, at least on a gender basis, 50-50 than they were in the past. And yet we weren't evolving our talent pool at the same rate that our sources of talent were evolving. And that led me to conclude that we were only really fishing in half the talent pool, which felt like the wrong answer. There's a whole other half of the talent pool that we wanted to attract to Bain, but that actually required some action on our part to to market ourselves somewhat differently. Maybe just to build on that a little bit, Hugh, I think one of the unique opportunities we had was at the undergrad level, Frankly, our universities in this country had kind of pivoted beyond 50-50 to being a little bit more female. Our business schools actually are still trending anywhere from between 35 and 45%. A few of the more progressive ones are closer to 50-50. We were seeing better success to bring in closer to um, gender neutral, gender parity classes at the undergrad higher level. One of the unique opportunities that we recognized was we had to bring some of our really great women client leaders onto campus at the undergrad level. We had to showcase the ways in which our 
kick butt women. We're actually leading great client insights, not just come to campus and talk about sustainability or work-life balance. We are on some ways actually narrowing our own appeal by not recognizing that the best talent in the world, whether it's male or female, wants to join a firm where they're going to be able to grow, develop, have a great career, have great impact. And also we recognize that where we were making progress recruiting wise and installing out mid-career, that was going to require some real investment by a lot of our male leaders, actually. And we had to unleash more sponsorship versus mentorship. It's important just for some of your listeners to understand the difference. Any of us can mentor someone that's offering coaching, feedback, advice, and basically then saying, good luck, let me know how it goes. Whereas a sponsorship relationship is going a step further and really advocating for that individual to continue to grow, to develop, to look for opportunities where they can showcase their talents, to be in their corner and be a true career champion and almost co-brand your own reputation with that person's. And I've seen you do that multiple times, Hugh. And I think in our private equity practice, frankly, great examples across your leadership team of sponsoring. And that has shown itself in terms of the growth of amazing women leadership in that practice that I think runs some of our most important accounts and are, are visible in almost everything we do in your sector. I'd love to take credit to say we intentionally did that back in the mid-1990s, but I think it just kind of happened and we began to build on it. And we did uh, need to engage not only our female talent to show role models, how this can all work, but we also needed the males to provide sponsorship to a variety of female managers and partners to ensure that they felt that they were included. It wasn't just a separate group of females at Bain actually figuring out how to make it work, but it was an integrated with the rest of the company and everyone trying to make the experience work, whether you're male or female at Bain Company. And I personally remember some of those bonding experiences as some of the more rewarding experiences that I've had at the firm. But you're talking about a lot more than gender when you're talking about backgrounds and representation. Do the same lessons scale to the other underrepresented groups, or does DEI require a deeper reimagining of the office culture? Um, wow, that is a great question and many faceted. Um, I want to be super clear uh, in that I think there's a lot we can learn from the ge- journey on gender, but I think race and ethnicity for sure are harder and they have more nuance and will require some different skills, approaches, and interventions. Why do I say that? The main reason is that all of us have a mother. Many, many of us have either wives, daughters, or sisters. So we live with folks of both genders. We still largely live more segregated lives outside of the family. If you think about schools, if you think about churches, if you think about communities and neighborhoods, they are still more segregated, and therefore we have less day-to-day lived experience across racial and ethnic lines than we do across gender lines. Now, what's interesting is the workplace in the U.S. has been shown as the more diverse place compared to, again, church, community, school system. So I think we have opportunity as you bring these groups together, but it takes a ton of intentional investment to be a more inclusive place. And I have a hard time talking about diversity without also talking about inclusion, because the only way that you get the real benefits of bringing together diverse teams is if you create that inclusive atmosphere where people feel that they can share their point of view and it will be valued. And unless that's there, folks of different backgrounds tend to hang back. I think that's a fascinating comment about inclusion. What is that playbook or what are some of the elements of that playbook? How are you reimagining some of the diversity initiatives today at Bain from, say, the sponsorship programs of yesteryear to kind of meet where we are today? Yeah, I think inclusion or inclusive teaming is the title we've been giving some of these newer interventions. I think a lot of times we show up to work and what we'd expect to be able to do is be heads down, just get the work done. Let's only talk about the work and let's move forward. What I think we're realizing is that when you combine folks from a variety of different experiences, both outside the workplace and inside, If we're not attentive to how that whole person is doing, we will likely not get their best work. So spending a bit more time taking an interest in their lived experience outside of work could just be personal activities. It could be their family life. It could be their hobbies. Or it could also be recognizing that there's been a spike in hate crimes against a number of different ethnicities in this country. And if something has recently happened, do we at least take the time to ask, how are you doing? Sometimes I think our leaders are afraid of those conversations because they're afraid they'll say the wrong thing. And I'm here to say there is no wrong thing to just checking in with how someone's doing and demonstrating a human interest 
in the person and where they're at today. And by the way, those requirements are on the leadership side, but also the team member side, peer to peer. Are you checking in with your teammates? Are you creating space in those one-on-one -on -one dialogues to just get to know each other and build that trust, build that sense of support? And we have to actually generate some shared understanding of our various life experiences as a foundation to how we best team together and do amazing work harnessing all the benefits of all of our diverse backgrounds. So that's a part of it that I don't think was as meaningful an element in our earlier playbooks. So Julie, you've made a very compelling case that diversity has been very important for Bain in our evolution, but you've also described that this just doesn't happen. We have to be intentional. If there really is a war for diverse talent going on out there, you need to actually have a battle plan. Where am I going to find sources of diverse talent? What types of talent am I going to go after? How do I onboard that talent? How do I make sure that, that I include that talent, that I make sure that I retain that talent in the future and that I utilize that talent and integrate it with the rest of my team and make sure that I'm actually walking the walk and not just talking the talk about what we should look like. So this strikes me like it, it's like an investment plan. I have to sort of come up with an investment thesis. I have to build a, a due diligence. I have to underwrite some risks. I have to then create a, a value creation plan that see here are the four or five big things that I need to do in order to win. And I have to do, apply that to my own firm and my own DE&I strategy, or I'm just not going to win. Is that right? That's 100% right, Hugh, and I'll even build it on it a little bit further because we'd say that today there's such high demand for more types of diverse talent. If you're not up in your game on how to retain talent, you're just going to really have a suffering of that revolving door phenomenon that I described. So part of what I think needs to happen is an equalized focus on both acquisition of talent and retention of talent. So that's why the inclusion conversation we were having is so important and how we lead and the atmosphere and the cultures we create at our firms will go a long way towards determining whether or not you can inflect the curve on representation. Julie, this has been a fascinating conversation. I really want to thank you for coming by and being on the show today for all of the insight and all of the tremendous conversation. Thanks again. Oh, absolutely. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed it and look forward to future conversations. I'm Hugh MacArthur. Thank you for listening.